from the deepest oceans to the peaks of the world's highest mountains, get ready for an adventure into the wonder and excitement that is our planet. In this hour, we take a hike from Mongolia to Australia. Then we meet someone who goes from being a goat herding nomad in Somalia to an international supermodel. And finally, saving sharks and their fins from the soup. This is National Geographic Weekend. Welcome. This is National Geographic Weekend. I'm Boyd Matson. Well, in the course of doing this radio show, you know we have brought on some adventures. People who set out on incredible treks, amazing feats of physical and mental endurance. We've had some extreme walkers on the program, but I don't think we've ever had anyone to top this guest. Sarah Marquis is, in fact, in the middle of an expedition right now, walking from Siberia to Australia. She's in the midst of this 12,500-mile trek. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Hello. <laughs> what does happen, by the way, when you get to the end of China and hit the water? Uh, when I'm going to hit the water, I'm going to take a cargo boat uh, on to Borneo, where I'm going to cross Borneo, then another, another cargo boat on the way down to Australia. <laughs> now, Australia is familiar territory. You've already walked across Australia. You did that trek about 8,750 miles, and it's just you setting off by yourself, like you've done now, hauling your gear on your yes. back and, and sometimes pulling a little cart. Yeah, it, this is my idea of uh, discovery. And I end up to hunt my food, and so I've been uh, surviving on snakes and lizards and things like that. It was really challenging and, uh, to see how the body works and the mind on those situations. That was really interesting to me. Now, you didn't do the whole trek on survival mode, did you? Didn't you occasionally no, go pull no. into a town and buy supplies? Uh, Yes, yeah, so every time that I was uh, I was going to a little village, I was like eating like a pig, really, <laughs> <laughs> because m most of the time I was really starving. Would you end up going days without a snake sandwich? Days without oh, having yes. anything to eat? Yes, I mean it was really usual that I was like going like for two or three days in a row with nothing, because when. When you are there hunting, you you catch something not every day. I was I was walking twelve hours a day, and then you hand, you you put your camp, you set up you set up your camp, and then you're going hunting. So I was going hunting for two hours at night, and sometimes I was catching something not every time. But I was getting better with the time, you know. At the beginning, you're really not that good. But at the end, uh, I was using a blow gun and a slingshot. Blow gun and, and a slingshot. Uh, well, I will say, that is a true test of endurance and adventure. And then when you finally get something to eat, it turns out it's a snake. Yeah. Uh, in, in Australia, it was... Um, I, I get I get really well informed. And uh, with um, I, w I went to contact a really uh, specialist about snakes before I left. So I knew a lot about those snakes because most of them, they're poisonous. So I've, I've done my study before leaving uh, Switzerland, so I had a lot of knowledge about that, but no experience, which is another thing, really. <laughs> well, you've got the experience now. We're talking with Sarah Marquis here on National Geographic Weekend, adventurer, wanderer, explorer extraordinaire, who just decides she's going to do something and sets off with the clothes on her back and some in the backpack and sometimes pulling a little cart with some extra supplies or her tent, a, a sleeping pad. I saw you walking because you post some blog posts of your trips. And right now you're on this journey from Siberia to Australia and you're in China at the moment. And I looked at some pictures of you there. You're going off without a guide, uh, without an interpreter and just showing up in the countryside as you pass some of these villages and these people trying to communicate with them, explain what you're doing. And, and I don't know, do you bargain for food, ask for food at some of these? How how, how do you get by without speaking the language? <laughs> oh, that, that, I tell you, it's a really good question because uh, you can imagine those people, that most of them, they never see a white guy around here because it's a really remote area. And uh, so you try to communicate. Body language doesn't ring the bell for them because they don't, they're not using that kind of way of speaking between them. 
it's another set of mind. And then when they see you not speaking the language, they talk to you, they yell at you because they think if, if they speak more <laughs> loud, you probably understand. <laughs> and then the next stage is they write down on a Chinese uh, uh, ideogram. So you have to tell them that you don't, you can't even read <laughs> what they're <laughs> writing to you. And then the next stage, it's really sweet people, really nice people. So you end up laughing and uh, uh, I them going in a little shop and taking what I need and they understand. And, uh, and, but some, it's a long process to get actually just uh, uh, an instant noodles, for, for instance, really. It's, it's a long process of communication, really. Now, the route you're taking... Are you following roads, or sometimes you're just striking out across uh, open land with uh, with no guidepost? Uh, where I am at the moment, I'm uh, next to a little river. I'm in my tent. It's 4 o'clock in the morning with the time difference. <laughs> and I'm in my tent. On my right-hand side, I've got a river. On my, on my left, I've got a small road, and I'm a really narrow goat at the moment. So I'm heading off tomorrow. I want to go through a, a really high pass, bamboo land and uh, pine trees. And uh, to get to that pass, I need to go through those villages. That's always the case here. I'm in Sichuan, which is kind of a populated area. Uh, it's a minority. Uh, we call them we people. So they've got really nice clothes on, really colorful clothes. It's really amazing. And then when I get to that pass, I'm free to go where I want. So it's always a, a free land, then go down to a village that's a populated area, then again going up and go to a pass the way now in Sichuan. And then in 200 kilometers, I'm going to hit west, really west in a Tibetan area, which is going to be a different story because it's going to be really high altitude, amazing place, really. You're going across the Tibetan plateau then? Uh, it, it's not, the, we call that Tibetan region. It's not actually in a Tibetan area. It's just it's still in China, in the China side. Okay. And in this trip, as far between food sources or uh, commercial food sources as you were in Australia, have you gone two or three days on this trek without eating? Uh, not this one, no. No, I'm really uh, experienced on, on scheduling my food. <laughs> so uh, when I see I'm, I'm not get, getting to a source of food, I'm actually uh, cutting down the food. So at the morning, I eat, I've got a bit of oatmeal. And at night, I've got some rice. That's all. And between, uh, I try to get some uh, some source of uh, small biscuits, but they don't have it here. So what happens, I'm usually cooking a big pot of rice at night, and that keep me going to the next day. We're talking with Sarah Marquis here on National Geographic Weekend about her trek from Siberia to Australia on foot, carrying all of her supplies with her. Well... That really must inspire you during the day to think, ooh, I can hardly wait to get to dinner because it's, a, it's a, another bowl of rice. Another <laughs> bowl of rice. Day after, but then for yeah. breakfast, it'll be another bowl of oatmeal. That's boring. <laughs> really, Sarah? Yes, it's boring, but I, 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 I'm in a stage where food doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it, you know when you head off to an expedition like that, you've got few stages. You've got the first two months where you you really don't know really what you're doing. <laughs> you don't really understand. And then uh, after three months, uh, you get used to the rhythm of every day, uh, sleeping in a tent and waking up and doing a big effort for twelve hours. And then, so you dreaming, you dreaming about, uh, dream about a nice coffee, uh, about nice food, and then you pass that stage where nothing really matters, but you're just happy to be there at the moment, and that's why I'm here for really. Well, it's an extraordinary adventure. Uh, we would like to check in with you again as you proceed toward Australia and find out more about. Uh, uh, what life is like on the trail. But yeah, good, it would be a pleasure, really. Good luck to you, and uh, and we will we will check in again because this is a it's a fascinating story. You've been doing this for twenty years now, walking in different places around the planet. Uh, and for before this began, I think it was something like uh, uh, eighteen thousand miles you've done just yes on on foot. So it's and now you're going to add another twelve thousand miles on this trip. So you have really covered the planet 
just on the strength of your <laughs> two legs and and rice yes. and rice. <laughs> Don't forget the rice. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. It was really nice to talk to you. So Good see luck. you soon. Yes, we will talk yes, to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Folks, I'm just here to promise you the possibility of brighter times ahead, better days tomorrow, and to tell you fairy tales can come true. I'm not talking about just in the world of Walt Disney. No, in real life. In fact, in film from National Geographic, so it is based on a true story going from a goat herder in Somalia to the runways of international fashion as a supermodel. It's a true story. We will share it with you when we return here on National Geographic Weekend. I'm Boyd Matson.